Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. and on Alela 54. Today, I have two friends that are meeting for the first time. This is very exciting for me. They're both going to Paris for COP21, and that's, I have to look it up every time I do it, um, um, is um, coming up. Stuart's leaving tonight. My guests, Stuart uh, Scott, who describes himself as an eco-social strategist attempting to influence human civilization's current collision course with nature. He was the first environmentalist stockbroker on Wall Street in the 1970s. That's quite a feat, Stuart. Um, in the 80s, he was an IT consultant for major New York City banks, and in the 1990s, he was a senior software engineer for IBM. So he has been an active participant at the UN-sponsored climate negotiations for years and founded the United Planet Faith and Science Initiative. Mouthful, yeah. But I know Stuart from permaculture and agriculture. We took, um, we took a, a, a really extended um, organic um, agriculture course together and then followed it up with Ted Bradovich's organic crop production class at UH. So um, we, we know each other from, from, the, from the trenches. From sustainability trenches, yes. There we go. And my other guest today is um, Anukri Hiddel, who has a master's in international affairs from Columbia and a master's in forestry from Duke. But I know Anu from paddling canoes. So they are both um, professionally uh, engaged in climate change, but in really different ways. So. Um, Let's have um, you first, Stuart. Tell us um, why. Are, tell us a little about you, and then you're getting on a plane tonight to go to Paris. Yeah. Well, I um, quit my day job teaching college here in Honolulu in 2008 to go off to the first one of these COPS Conference of Parties. It stands Thank for, you. which I attended. <laughs> it wasn't the first altogether, but it was. It was the 14th, in fact, and it was imposed on Poland. And I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do, but it turned out that I, I, I distinguished my skills as an impresario, and I brought together press conferences that were very interesting and compelling in one way or another. And I did that over the years and, and scored some firsts uh, at the climate negotiations that were, were helpful, I believe, at least the UN uh, climate secretary has said they were. And um, so I've been doing that uh, most years since. And uh, what I try to do is I try to put on press conferences that, are, that make this arcane thing called the COP understandable to people. And, and it's extremely important that it be because the future of humanity is being negotiated in Paris this year. And I'll have to say it doesn't look good. Okay. Why are you going, Anu? And tell us a little about you, too. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. And aloha, my kako. Um, I am actually a, an instructor at Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm here in Hawaii for the year. Um, and I'm researching climate change issues both on the ground as well as uh, I follow the global negotiations that, that uh, Stuart mentioned. So I take uh, students to the COP meeting, and the COP is the conference of the parties. Those are all the parties that are, uh, all the countries and governments that are parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And how many are there? There are 196 parties, okay. 195 countries and the European Union. There are a couple of observer states, like the Holy See. At least Which last I the, looked. We call that the Vatican, but it's known as the Holy See. So. Yeah. Right. Well, he's been doing his bit for climate change this year, huh? Yes. So, um, so anyway, the UNFCCC, which is the treaty that these parties are, uh, that these countries are party to, and that deals with the climate negotiations. I take students to this to these meetings um, 
along with another instructor. So the two of us, we, because it's two weeks long and it's too much time for us to spend there with, uh, in the middle of the semester, um, we sort of split it up. The students basically go to observe what happens at these meetings. They're mostly undergraduate students and we uh, essentially we guide them through the process of um, these complex arcane negotiations. Uh, it's also to look at that bridge between science and what in these meetings what happens is that science is pretty much ignored and you have, uh, <laughs> and you have <laughs> politics and negotiations going on. And so it's really to see what happens. What, what, what is that leap from the science to that meeting where it really is theater? It's, it's the global theater. And so that's what our students observe. It's also very, very rich in side events, which means that it's got um, almost everybody and their brother and sister and Ohana over there, you know, in, in this climate world. And so uh, what, what the students do is they look at well, they network with some of these folks, but it's really for them to bring this information back to their community in St. Louis and back to their communities. Uh, well, they're working with the mayor of St. Louis, for example, uh, with the mayor's office on sustainability. And so they try to demystify some of these negotiations and bring it back to the ground level. So what kind of study programs would, are your students typically in? Uh, what are their majors, or is, is it open to anybody who's interested, or how, how do you get to go to the COP? Is the COP. It? There is an application process. It was all student-driven to begin with, and it wow. still is primarily student-driven. We're just the faculty that, that guide the students. The university is interested in having um, a sort of a faculty guidance, but it really is initiated by the students. And so uh, there's a student group that's the um, Washington University... Students for International Cooperation on the Environment, MUSAIS. And so, <laughs> and so they, uh, they essentially run that whole process. And it is open to everybody at Washington University. So every year they, they select students, and those students get to go. They can be any majors. Um, we also get, last year we had a student who's a postdoc engineering student who was interested in carbon capture and storage issues. Um, and we also had a third year law student. So we get, yeah, we get a range, but yeah. mostly it's undergraduate students who are interested in the process and interested in making a change. Of course, that's what young people like to do, and yeah. us old people too. <laughs> Some of us. And Stuart has, um, has uh, got a, a, a short video that is a, a nice overview, and um, we'll get to that in a minute. And um, uh, you also have a, a specific thing that you're going to do this time, which is um, make a documentary. Is that right, Stuart? I'm trying to get it together to make a documentary of okay. uh, what's going on at the, the COP, what people should know. Okay. Let's have a look at your, at your past video. My name is Stuart Scott. I'm the founder of the UPFSI. Faith, religion, spirituality, and science are on the same page. The COP is the annual conference of parties. It's the meeting of 192 nations, all coming together to try to iron out how do we make an agreement to save the planet, to save civilization. The COP is composed of power centers, of caucuses, within the political realm, within the economic realm. There is a cacophony where there should be an orchestra. Right now, we are at 0.85 degrees centigrade above the 1850 average. 1850 is used as the baseline because it's pre-industrial revolution. At current conservative projections, in what year will we no longer be within that familiar band over the past 150 years? And globally, it came out 2043. That is, less than 30 years from now, the coolest days then will be equivalent to the warmest days now. We are dealing with the possibility of the extinction of humanity and the extinction of life on Earth. We have the opportunity to change our path. This year in Paris is critical. I need you to help the world see what I see at the COP. Because over the years I've been going, I've seen some remarkable things behind the scenes. But none of it gets out 
I'll be there to reveal to humanity what's going on, what's not going on, what should be going on. We need a film. It is far more likely that we will save humanity out of Hollywood than out of Washington, D.C. We're back with Stuart Scott and Anu Hiddle. And Anu, you are here this year as a visiting scholar at the East West Center. That's right. So what do you get to do for a year in Hawaii besides mm -hmm. paddle with me? <laughs> Well, I'm focusing on two climate change related projects. And the first one, of course, is the, the global negotiations. But the second one is really more uh, based in Hawaii. And um, I'm looking at how the state of Hawaii is adapting to climate change. And what are the, what are the um, policies and the processes being put in place for that? So I'm just sort of getting my feet wet, ha ha. <laughs> you know, but it's interesting how many puns we have that derive from climate change related things. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm just starting to gain some traction on that. Um, and the state has convened a, uh, there, there have been several initiatives, as you know. One of them is that uh, there's a interagency climate adaptation committee, ICAC. There's another acronym for you. Whose is that? That's the states, the, the states. state of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. This is not the green growth, no. Hawaii green growth. I okay. don't believe so. This is the state by legislative act has uh, formed a committee to look into climate adaptation. Wow, that's great. And one of the things that they're looking at is sea level rise. So I'm sort of involved in that effort, not as a state partner or anything, but just as an independent researcher. So that's one of my reasons for being here. Oh, so you get to do research. I get to do research, yes. Wow, right. fun. And that's sort of the whole point of also taking our students there, which is that that's what they do is research. So we're part of the research and independent non-governmental organizations known as the Ringos. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta, another one. We gotta get the acronyms in there. In the alphabet soup. Right. You know, um, a lot of people wonder, you know, what is it that they do at the East West Center? Well, here we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something really exciting. One of the things I'll have to interject is that uh, people are still focused on some of the long-range effects, at least in the state of Hawaii, sea level rise. That is not the biggest problem we have. The biggest problems we have will be far sooner in time. The sea level rise is an inconvenience compared to the big problem. The big problem is that by the middle of this century, there won't be enough food globally to feed our population, the world population and what that's going to translate into geopolitically is anybody's guess. The military, the Pentagon, is already making preparations for this. That's our big problem. Except you and I know how to solve that food problem, don't we, Stuart? Not how to solve it. I know that we should be looking harder at um, saving the agricultural land we have here. Small scale. Big scale and small scale, both. both. There's a big land loss that's going to happen where they're going to convert uh, 1,500 acres of prime ag land into 12,000 uh, homes. Oh, yes. Well, you're speaking very locally now. Yes, yes. Ho'opili, that is. Ho'opili, yeah. and, and oh. that's a travesty. It's almost all done. It's signed, sealed, and almost delivered, but it's being brought back to the Supreme Court, and the Land Use Commission is reconsidering. And I'm praying that they stop it, because it's extremely ill-advised, very short-sighted. Um, that's a great way of thinking about how um, we can address climate trains change here in Hawaii that people don't really think about. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, we need to keep the agricultural lands mm -hmm. because who knows when that um, is going to be really an urgent issue and if we wait until then we probably won't have time to react in, a, in an appropriate Correct. way. Correct. Well, one, one of the problems is with people is that we are very poorly suited to assessing long-term risk. If there's a fire, if there's a beast charging at us, or a weapon, we know how to handle that, but we don't know how to handle long-term risk. Long-term risk, okay. Um, well, we're gonna take a short break and um, come back and talk about risks and rewards of present action. Hi, my name is Cindy Matsuki, and I host High Growth with HTDC, where we talk about all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing, because 
there are tons of things that are happening in Hawaii in those fields, and we like to share them with you because people, more people should know about them. This show broadcasts live every other Tuesday at 3 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. And tune in, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborate and, and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland on Think Tech Hawaii. I am Kaui Lucas, and my two climate change specialists today are Anu Hiddle and Stuart Scott. And they are both on their way to COP21 in Paris. Stuart, you've been to how many of them, did you say? Oh, probably half a dozen of them. And you, Anu? This is just going to be my second COP, so I'm a real newbie at it. But I've okay. been in climate change issues for a while. There for are, a long are, time. There are also yeah. meetings that happen during the year that are right. not high profile. And there are sometimes three, four, or five of them in a particular year. And I go to many of those, mm -hmm. too. OK, well, well, what do you think is going to happen this time? Um, not enough. Not enough. What I think will happen is that there will be some sort of agreement non-binding. Everyone will get to pat themselves on the back and go home and declare success, but it will not be enough to save humanity according to what the science says is required. According to what the science is required, and who's really looking at that? Well, um, I mean, are they looking at that? Well, they are. The, mean, the, the way the game was set up, and I call it a game, I, it's a well-chosen word. The way the game was set up is they appointed a panel called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. 2,500 scientists, economists, a bunch of specialists looking at the problem. What needs to be done? What's feasible? What can be done? But they've kind of hobbled the IPCC in certain ways so that the policymakers don't get their feet held too close to the fire. They've gamed the situation. So the IPCC reports are always understating the problem in terms of timing, in terms of severity. And this is not one of those situations where we can say, oops, sorry, we made a mistake, because billions of lives are at stake. So that's the science, the IPCC. Now, there are scientists who refuse to participate in the IPCC because they know that this science is dumbed down a bit for the policymakers. Um, one of those scientists is Dr. James Hansen, the world's foremost climate scientist. And he um, has always refused to go to the UN climate negotiations until this year. He's agreed to come to be part of the, the, the work that, that, that I'm doing there with these press conferences, these Climate Matters press conferences. So he is the source of the principal number, two degrees C, that you will see in reports about climate change. Um, and Anu, what, what do you think is going to happen this time? Well, I essentially I agree with Stuart that probably not a whole lot in terms of moving forward, but I think that we expect too much when we expect that we're going to see some action from a huge, gigantic, 196-country beast that's plodding along. I think that when you look back and you see when the UNFCCC came into being, which was in 1992, and it's been all this time, and we feel frustrated saying, well, it's been 20-some years, and what's going on over here? Let's get moving already. The planet is warming. But I think it's, it's wrong in some ways for us. It's a bit unfair for us to say this is what, what, a, what an elephant should do. An elephant should run like a cheetah. You know, yeah, yeah. so I think that's a bit unfair. I mean, if you've tried to get a visa from a government, you know, I tried to get one from the Indian government. I hope they're not going to come down on me for saying this. <laughs> but anyway, the truth is the truth. And it took me three months. So imagine that if just one visa, one government, one person, 196 parties, really, we've had a bit of progress, you know. 
since 2009, Copenhagen, I would say we've had uh, at least countries have started to look at what they're reducing. They're they're trying to get to a non uh, to a binding treaty where they can say they let's. They're not trying to get to a binding treaty. They're trying to get to a voluntary treaty. Yes, and so and they will try and figure out that those you know. However, we're not going to negotiate those words here. Okay. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that in 2009 they did agree to reduce, especially countries like the U.S., China, and India. And then in Cancun in 2010, they actually set up a green climate fund, $100 billion a year by 2020, starting in 2020. Now, we've only pledged about, um, I think last I looked, about $10 billion. So $100, $100 billion altogether? All countries will together need to be in this pot by 2020. And obviously the, the, the richer year. countries will per have. Year. Per year. Per year, yes. So somebody has to decide who owes what. Has that been agreed on? Right. So, well, people have, countries have started pledging, okay? And they've pledged about, a hun uh, about 10 billion. And you can say, well, that's very far from 100 billion. And it is. But we've never seen 10 billion even before. So this is progress. From an elephant, this is progress. And so I, I am still, I think this is actually quite exciting and um, that there is actually movement. And I think that this is what peace looks like. This is how countries negotiate. This is how there is political theater when you have governments. And this is what we should expect. Life is a messy business. Life is a messy business and politics makes it messier, perhaps more exciting for some people and frustrating for others and for young people it's very, very frustrating because they see, you know, 23 years is like a, is a lifetime for them. And they think that no progress has been made. But I would say that, you know, we've already started putting some money towards it. There's, there are things happening at the subnational level, which is really where this will need to, will all come down. But if you don't have the mission statements of heads of state saying, yes, we must do these things for climate change, um, you know, we're not going to, your, your subnationals are not going to be able to follow in the same way. And this might be a, a, a good moment to celebrate what's happened in the United States just in the last day, that, or two days, that um, we have a president that's come out and, and said no, no on the Keystone. And how about the Attorney General of New York, huh? Saying Exxon, mm-mm-mm, looking into that. So, so they're, they're, they're small things, maybe, but... Um. Well, they're big things, but still mm -hmm. not enough. They're incremental. The, and Keystone, for the viewers who don't under, uh, know the, the word, they were trying to push through a pipeline that would deliver the world's really most the ugliest fossil fuels from the tar sands in Alberta to the refineries uh, in our Gulf Coast. And that was the Keystone XL pipeline, and, and Obama decided to... Uh, uh, not support it, to not allow it to go through. Not only um, is it not being supported, but I mean, given how long and how hard it has been fought for, it's, um, and I mean, there's parts of it that are, that are already built. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to still have the strength to come in and say, no, this really is not what we need. That, I, that is hopeful, that they're yeah. willing to uh, go up against the, uh, the economic force that's trying to drive it through. That is hopeful. Well. So um, when you get to Paris, Scott, I mean, Stuart, you're, you're leaving tonight. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're getting there a little early. A month you, early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what are you going to do? Um, well, actually, I'm going to get ready for what I'm going to do there, because uh, a lot of what I do, I have to set up locally. If I'm going to film a documentary, I still need to get the, uh, the people who do the, the camera work, the sound work. I need to get them accreditations, badges to get into the COP, and those are very difficult to get this year. Um, wow. I need to make contact with the press, the uh, Associated Press, U UPI, all of the international agencies will be there, the New York Times. I need to get the local bureau chiefs on board so I get coverage to what I do. Well, I have to tell you, I was in Paris this summer in, in June for a couple of weeks, and um, I I was amazed at already in June how mm -hmm. abuzz the city was about the COP. And um, I, have a, I have dear friends there. So if anybody feels like um, sending me to Paris to um, <laughs> attend, I'm 
I got a place to stay. It's all good. You know, it's, it's happened before in my life. Just thought I'd throw it out there. But Paris is so on board about this. Everywhere you go in the city, you know, there, there, there's a, a, I was waiting for a bus and I looked across and, and there were these big um, uh, banners about it. And it's, um, it's really, um, Paris, you are going to be amazed. I'm going to give you a little place to, a couple places to go. <laughs> what it, as an urban center, Paris is doing uh, to address climate change, biodiversity, um, urban gardens. It's phenomenal. I mean, Honolulu could really learn a lot from Paris. So I'm glad you've got some time to... Um, um, kick around there, Stuart. Those are, those are uh, all the things you mentioned are still the, the small feel-good things, the recycling, mm -hmm. the urban gardens, that's not what's going to, to, to save us. So we, we really need nations to, um, to do more than just pledge money for the Green uh, Fund. Um, mm -hmm. We need them to actually do something very difficult, which is to say that they will get by with, without the fossil fuels that they are currently putting, putting into their economies. And there's no nation on earth that's happy about that, and they're all trying to obfuscate and, you know, um, and, but that's what it comes down to. And that's why Exxon Mobil getting called on the carpet for their having lied for 30 years is very significant, very significant. Stuart, um, also when you're in Paris, they have the, um, they have the car to go, so there are little stations all over the mm. city where if you have your card, your car to your car to go card, you can. They are all electric vehicles. Mm, good. Not <laughs> only that, if you have an electric vehicle, you can charge your vehicle at these little car to go. It's not actually called that. I forget what it's called, but um, these little car to go stations. I mean, Honolulu, we could so do that. Mm -hmm. You know, but the, the, Stuart's right. I mean, this is this is sort of the little stuff. You know, these are little things. Um, there are countries out there, China, India, Brazil, and I go to India twice a year, so I see this. I've seen it for the last 30 years. People want to be wealthy. People want things. They don't want to just sit there eating their little whatever roots they're roots eating. Roots and rice? Yeah, rice they don't want to do the, the roots and rice thing. Yeah. They you want know? to copy us. Right. And, and that, in their minds, that's wealthy. I mean, they want, and some of them want even basics like air conditioning in 111 degrees summer. You know, that would be pretty basic. So how do we so, do air conditioning without ruining the planet? Right. So now suddenly we have all these people, and goodness, they want actually to have a comfortable life. You know, where right now, yes, the growth in air conditioners is phenomenal in India, but there are units that are just like room units that are being used to just like take, out, take the edge off 111 degree day. It's, so, you know, it's not like these are people that are just air conditioning the bejeebers out of their homes and their surroundings. Yeah, so they're not, they're, it's not the 5,000 square foot per person um, McMansion, McMansion right. that's right. being overheated and overcooled. Right. But we're talking basic, basic right. level comfort and you you bring up the issue of of, of justice really right and um, equity equity mm -hmm. um, which is uh, maybe not talked about enough I think science gets uh, it's part of the negotiations it is in the negotiations but it's you know again what can you really expect from the negotiations you know these are countries they're trying this is the political theater this is a game a drama whatever a play you know <laughs> it's not going to be the answer so if, to it's everything. A, if it's a play, a drama, why are we doing this? You know, I, I'll say for the audience what I said to you, you both the other night, is that there are three schools of thought about why we're doing this. And one school of thought holds that getting an agreement this year is absolutely necessary, even if it's not strong enough, just to show that we're on board and making progress. We have to have an agreement. Should have been made 20 years ago, but we need it now. That's one school of thought. Second school of thought says, no, if we don't have a strong enough agreement, we should not have any agreement because a weak agreement will all go back to sleep and we're done for. Mm -hmm. And the third school of thought says, it's already too late. Doesn't matter what you do, unfortunately. And there's 
some scientific credibility to that school of thought also. We have a very serious situation and people don't get it. Why they don't get it? Because it's not in the news media's best interests to project the severity of it. Let me, let me. I, I disagree. With, with, with which part? I made a huge statement. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> a rich one. With layered. With, okay, yes. pick a part. <laughs> So I think for the first part, which is that those are the three options, I would say, well, what's the alternative to doing something like this, to having a global community talking about what they would like to see? Okay. And this, by, by well, global I didn't, community I didn't is also... Which of, the three, which of the three schools I belong to, and I think we should be going forward. That's okay. why I'm going to Paris. Okay. So then maybe I do agree. Oh, so anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but let's but, hear but your I, discussion. Please, but please, but I, do, I do think that, you know, there isn't really another alternative at this point. Correct. And that is one reason we have these negotiations. I mean, again, I will say that what this is, this is how nations behave, and this is how they... Uh, this is, this is your collective action. This is, we have a common goal. We're working together you know, to try and achieve that goal. And we're trying to do it peacefully. Yeah, there's some you know, animation and some anima animosity and so on. But we're essentially, this is, this is how nations interact, right? And so this is what we should expect. All right, well, let's take a little break. And then we'll be right back um, and talk some more about COP 21 in Paris. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner and I host Sustainable Hawaii every Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. My guests offer insights on challenging economic and environmental issues facing our state and offer innovative solutions to increasing Hawaii's long-term sustainability. Recently, we've been focusing on sustainable land development, food, and energy security. If you have a project or issue you'd like to discuss on the show or would like to be a guest, please contact me at kirstenbturner at gmail.com and tune in live weekly or view the show at your convenience at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas and today we're talking about climate change and the upcoming COP21 in Paris with Stuart Scott and Anu Hittel. And let's, let's talk for a minute about the, the repercussions of um, all of this on our, our little old islands here in the middle of the Pacific. Um, what, what, what are we doing here locally? Um, it, do we have lessons? What can we bring from these, this process that's going on in COP21? How, how are we doing here, Stuart? Uh, we're waking up. Uh, Hawaii is one of the most vulnerable, it's the most vulnerable of the 50 United States, shall we say, because we derive our food from everywhere else for the most part. Uh, we're very vulnerable to ocean rise, even though I say that's not our principal problem. Um, so the state is responding. I actually made a, a, a presentation, and I give a pretty strong presentation, dire, to the, uh, to the legislature all, uh, this week but it was unfortunately poorly, the bad news, it was poorly attended. The good news is something strong will come out of it. Uh, well, tell us who showed up, because that's important. Um, Senator Gabbard. Yay. Uh, Rep Representative Chris Lee. Awesome. And Representative Calvin Say. And wow. then the, the aides of two other uh, legislators came also. And I didn't write down the names of the legislators. But um, Senator Gabbard is going to actually advance legislation, which is something that I recommended as one of my interventions, equivalent to solutions, one of the things we should be doing, which is to try to get the, the employee retirement system for the state of Hawaii to divest from fossil fuels. Wow, stocks. wouldn't that be fabulous? Yes. Now, the yeah. University of Hawaii di divested or declared they would divest, instructed their, their investment in, uh, managers to divest within three years from all fossil fuels. That's significant because there's a lot of coal divestment going on, which is the dirtiest of the fuels. But complete divestment is the strong message. And so the state of Hawaii hopefully will get legislation to act on that will divest the employee retirement system from all the fossil fuels. Okay, quick question. So I, um, with this whole next era, so forth, um, it seems that most um, power companies are generating power from a mix of fuels. So if you, 
if you are divesting, do you divest? Uh, does it count? I mean, if they're, you know, if they're 30% renewables but 70%. Uh, fossil fuel, or is there? Uh, yeah, okay. I don't uh, want to get into that too much, right, but that, just just a broad quick. brush. Um, next era apparently wants to take us to from coal and oil to natural gas. Okay, that well, would that, that would be progress, but not if you get solidly into natural gas, where you build all the infrastructure and then you're committed for the next fifty or a hundred years to burning natural gas. Yeah, yeah. No, I, we natural have to go gas to is a fossil fuel, so that, yes, that, we that's have to not a renewable. We have to go to so, renewables as quickly as possible, and Hawaii in, has them all. Right. And so in this divesting process, um, I was just wondering whether it counts if, are, if, if, if um, the state of Hawaii has stock in HECO, and HECO's 20% burning coal, does that mean that the the state of Hawaii has to divest itself of, of HECO stock? Um, well, we're getting into the arcane stuff okay. now, but right. there's, there's a carbon somebody tracker. somebody let me know? <laughs> there's a carbon tracker 200. That is a, a, an outfit is tracking the 200 worst of the fossil fuel stocks. And so divestment means you'll divest from the 200 worst carbon, uh, carbon fuels uh, plays. Okay. Okay, so we, we, we are doing something concrete, and yes. um, uh, you think that this the divestment is a is is maybe a more real way or a quicker way or a well, it starts helpful. off as symbolic um, until it gains speed. Let me cite something. When I was on Wall Street, there was a system uh, uh, of pol a political control in South Africa called, called apartheid, where a white minority ruled a black majority. Um, and the event which was credited with spelling the downfall or the peaceful change to majority black rule was when the California Employee Retirement System, CalPERS, announced that it would divest from the stocks of all companies doing business with South Africa. IBM got out of South Africa. Eastman Kodak, at that point in time, the biggest name in, in film and camera, got out. Uh, so it's real. That it made it's real. that was Wilhelm de Klerk, who was the ruler of the white majority at that time. He said that was the point at which he knew the handwriting was on the wall. I remember waking. I was living in New York at the time, and I remember waking up, and there on the front of the New York Times was a picture of my um, high school classmate, who was now at Yale, protesting the um, investments, and I was like. Yeah, we're, we're there. We're s <laughs> so if, if the state of Hawaii divests from fossil fuels in its employee retirement system, that would be significant. California would probably come next. California, I think, has already announced coal divestment, the dirtiest. And the people who are getting their feet wet with divestment are saying, oh, we'll divest from coal. But if Hawaii goes for divestment from all the fossil fuels in, their, in the state's investments, that's a significant what is your what is you what are you seeing, Anu, from your perspective as a visiting scholar at the East West Center, or just mm -hmm. someone who has been coming to Hawaii for over twenty years regularly mm -hmm. in conservation? Right. Well, um, first of all, I think it's interesting that Stuart that you don't think that sea level rise is an issue. Oh, it's an issue. It's, it's not the one that's because, coming at us the fastest, though. Because I feel like that's kind of what we're surrounded by over here. And so it's actually, I'm surprised that Hawaii hasn't uh, put, put a plan together sooner. Um, so the coastal cities and coastal areas in uh, the United States, like San Francisco Bay Area, New York, Delaware, they've had plans for a while, and uh, since 2009, 2007, some of them. So, you know, just a little, that's, that's an interesting uh, observation. And the other one for me is that um, I'm also interested that, that uh, Senator Schatz is going to be at the uh, COP meeting. So there will be a, a Hawaii presence there as well. Excellent. So there is you know, stuff happening. And Hawaii also, incidentally, has one of the most aggressive renewable energy goals in the nation. Yes. And so all of these things are very interesting to me coming from a different state and coming here. Uh, either to a different country or a different state, depending on who you talk to. But, <laughs> yes, um, thank you. You know, so so um, I, I find those things very interesting, and that's what I'm really looking at. I'm working with um, 
sort of coastal land managers and trying to figure out their stories. How are they dealing with climate I events, especially hazards like erosion and so on? And for Hawaii, of course, beaches are a big deal. Um, and what, what are they doing in other places like Delaware or New York or, or San Francisco? Can you, do you, is there any example of something forward looking that? Well, they've done a lot of stakeholder engagement. So they really have looked at everybody who, is, who has got a stake in the issue. And they've, they've got them talking. So and they've we're come back up with to that, plans. Th we're back to that issue mm -hmm. of, of communicating broad scale with the stakeholders and, um, and getting community buy-in. Mm -hmm. In other words, just, justice issues. Mm -hmm. Well, well, justice and the people, yes, the people who are going to be affected by right. these things. Well, yeah. that's mm -hmm. how I see it as right. being yeah. just. Yeah. So they're doing more of that. Mm -hmm. And, well, they're doing a lot of that, and the, and the state governments are, they're working without a mandate from the, from the federal government, of course, right? I mean, it's not, all, it's not coming down from the federal government, since we're not really even party to the, never were party to the Kyoto Protocol or any of those things. We've never really liked to sign on to international global agreements. But, but Unless they're trade agreements. Somehow we well, like yeah, those. Well, yeah, trade's different. <laughs> but yeah, with... Uh, That's important. That's not an accident. Because the, the theme right. that relates those two is that the United States is so protective of econom its economic growth, its economic players, the large corporations, that they're not really willing to commit on climate change because there's a very clear inverse relationship between economic growth and climate change. You grow the economy more, climate becomes more of a problem. And really that's what I, you know, I really feel that's the, at the sub-national level is where we are, where we're trying to focus and where the action will really happen. So at the state level, for example, county, city governments and the stakeholders. So it's turning that tide slowly, going back to your elephant or that uh, Native American saying where, you know, if you want to go far, if you want to go quickly, uh, travel alone. If you want to go far, travel together. Well, and that's we why I'm going to Paris alone tonight and meeting up with people there. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm going to stay here <laughs> and meet with people here. <laughs> and <laughs> so... <laughs> And, re and keeping your, your carbon footprint down. So Stuart, do you, uh, do you measure your carbon footprint? You know, um, mm -hmm. I don't, and I actually am kind of uh, ashamed that I have such a, a large one, but I do as much as I can from wherever I can. And, and yet, because of the urgency of the straits that we're in, there are still things that need to be done in person. And so I, I go where I have to, when I have to. And my own meditation and prayer kind of leads me in that mm -hmm. resolving that conflict and what direction. I, I call myself a climate warrior. And it's hard to, hard to do battle from a distance at times. I, that, that's, a, that's a really good, strong image there. Well, so you two are going to um, be having your own adventures in Paris. And I, I wish you both really well and um, great success and some awesome croissants and coffee while you're there. Um, I'm so jealous. <laughs> I can't eat croissants. Oh, I'm gluten. allergic to the, uh, the butter and, and wheat. So. But you know, they, 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 um, they raise their wheat and um, cows differently. So. Yeah. Anyway. I'll, I'll try one at the end. They both put me to sleep, wheat, wheat and dairy, so I'll try one when it's all over. But perhaps when you, when you both come back, we can meet again here um, and talk about what actually did happen or in parents. <laughs> or did it. Yes. Which would be, a longer, right which would be a longer conversation, <laughs> of course. It's all fair game. Anyway, right. thank you both for coming down and no, talking thank you. with thank you. Mahalo for having us. Thank you. And we'll see you next week again at uh, Hawaii is my mainland Fridays at three o'clock next uh, week. Their Senator, State Senator Will Espero is going to be here talking about medical marijuana dispensary laws. And we'll have a very special guest who um, is, I call him the apothecary because he makes, um, he makes the medicines for people who really need it. And um, he'll be talking with us too. Aloha.